cocktails? Bye. I drive a Ferrari, 355 Cabriolet. What's up? I have a ridiculous house in the South Fork. I have every toy you can possibly imagine. And best of all, kids, I am liquid. So, now you know what's possible. Let me tell you what's required. Life advice, rr at gmail.com. Let's have at it. Okay, longtime listener, 30 years old, 6'3", 250. Big dude. We have a friend, let's call him Steve. And we've been friends since high school. We have a tight-knit group um, that always watches sporting events together, and Steve's always part of it. All right, so the group of guys all the way back from high school, they watch big games together. Or apparently they watch a lot of games together. However, he can be a tough hang during these events because he's very opinionated and thinks he knows more about, quote, X event or sport, unquote, than everyone else in attendance. He is knowledgeable to an extent, but his opinions are often time unwarranted and just kill the vibe. For example, I played football through college and have now coached high school for 10 years. Routinely, he will make comments about the game, including play calling, timeout usage, refereeing. Uh, when I try to give insight about situational awareness or rules, he is quick to start an argument or get temperamental. And don't even get me started on how belligerent he can be when the girlfriends are around. Uh oh. He also thinks he's the foremost expert on MMA and takes it upon himself um, to both commentate on the fights so he can't hear john anik a major sin as well as tell us what he'd do if he were fighting he just can't stop talking <laughs> i think we all know somebody like this long and short the he ruins my enjoyment of live sporting events with his commentary i know some of my friends also notice it from the eye rolls and head shaking that goes on but i don't know if it bothers them like it does me question being should i confront him about these tendencies he has and ask him to tone it down stop and risk not being invited to live events in the future am i wrong and should uh, just let him keep being him and adjust my expectations mentality at these events games. Have you ever experienced anything like this? Thank you. Uh, yeah, we all have. We all have. I was probably a little bit like this with baseball when I was in those peak Red Sox years where I didn't miss a game. I knew I knew more about the Red Sox than everybody else because I was obsessed with it. And I'm not talking about like everybody in Boston, but where I was living at the time, to the point where when I was bartending and a guy would ask a Red Sox question, the other bartenders would be like, just, just ask him because he's going to come over and be like, oh, what's going on? <laughs> and a lot of it had to do with the fact that nothing else was going well for me. So I'm wondering if your man Steve here doesn't have much else that's going on. Because then I would use that as kind of this identifying thing where it made me feel like I was actually contributing to whatever it was when I woke up every day. Like I had a thing. I had the Red Sox as an escape. And then I was going to be the guy that knew the most about it. And so that that let me feel like I had some value because at the time I had zero, I brought zero value to the table. So I actually think this is like a real deep deal here when you're in this group setting and you want to prove that you know it all. It's because I think there's probably something else not going on or things that aren't going that well. So I, you know, I'd be curious now, look, there's plenty of guys. There's plenty of guys that are doing really, really well and do the exact same thing. Okay. So let's, let's give you another example. I remember being at a college basketball game with Doug Gottlieb and, you know, Gottlieb is, is plugged in with college basketball. You heard him on this podcast. I mean, Doug talking college basketball is, is up there with anybody. He's just that good at it. And so he and I are watching a game and I wouldn't be like, you know, uh, Hey, I can't believe they're they're running the screen to that side, and then that's the way they're running the trap. <laughs> like I'm not going to do that in front of him. I don't know. It would take me a little while to figure that out anyway, right? And so there was another media guy that was sitting around us, and we weren't tight with him, but we all knew who each other were. And he started becoming like timeout guy, right? And so it was close, and then one of the teams after a make didn't call a timeout, brought it down, missed it. And then there was a foul and this kind of went on for a little while. So the one team we've all seen this before in basketball, right? So the one team that was down was still kind of chasing points here a little bit, putting them on the free throw line and all that kind of stuff. But there was this one moment where they could have called a timeout. They just didn't. They tried to get something going and said, let's just do it this way. We don't need to call a timeout. We'll save it for a little bit later. And so because they didn't call the timeout and of course, because it didn't work and they were going to lose the game, the guy turns around to me, but really more towards Gottlieb because he's looking kind of for Gottlieb's approval and says, should have got to got to use that time out there, right? Got to got to use it. Can't take him with you. And Doug's like, yeah, you know, fair, but I get it. And then, you know, another possession wouldn't go their way. The guy would turn around, and be like, I can't believe he didn't use the timeout. Can't believe, unexcusable, inexcusable. And you're just like, yeah, okay, man. 
And then he did it like a third time, like as we're leaving, the game's over, band's playing. He's like, huh, he goes, he's going to regret that one, huh? huh? And it's like, yeah, dude, we fucking get it. You think they should have called a timeout, and then they didn't, and it didn't work out, and so now you're right. Because I think that's something that we, we all have elements of at times is that, look, it happens to me plenty in this profession. I'm wrong, maybe wrong more. And when I'm wrong, admit it, some of you get off on it, all right? Because it's like this guy has a career where he's just basically sitting around watching games and then talking about it, and this is what he's been doing for almost 20 years. Well, I could have done that. Yeah, maybe maybe you could have. But there's something about feeling like you're right about an observation that's that's really, I don't know if there's an endorphin thing behind it. So what you have here is you have your guy who – Maybe he's just annoying. Maybe other things in his life are going great, all right? Because I'm, I'm using myself as an example in the Red Sox thing is why I knew I was kind of doing it because I was like, I don't really have anything else to talk about. Like, there's literally nothing. Like, you guys like jam bands? Like, I had nothing to bring to the table. So um, in this case, that could be part of it. It also could be there's, there's that, that guy that has that in his, in his DNA where – he likes to watch the people that are doing the things that are more accomplished, like the MMA part of it. Where it's like, up oh, arm bar, you got an arm bar there. Why is he not arm bar? Uh, you know, the arm bar has been there for three rounds and it's just <laughs> absurd. It's absurd to be that guy, but there's so many of those guys. I remember I also went to like this amateur MMA thing in Boston and I went with somebody who was actually like legitimately, we never said anything to him because he would have killed all of us um, because he was a good fighter, but he was also like wired differently in a very, very strange, like you could see it in his eyes way. And we watched, I don't know, seven or eight fights and I'm sitting next to him and he's like, these guys all suck. And I'm like, all right, all of them suck. None of them are tough. You'd beat all of them, you know? And so none of us really wanted to say that to him. But at one point I was like, dude, no one's good. No one's good. He's like, nope. He's like, technically, these guys are a mess. So I don't know why guys do that. I'll tell you too, man, guys do it way more than women do. I, I can't, as I'm thinking about this, it's not that I haven't talked to women that are opinionated and wrong about stuff all the time, but guys have this sense of wanting to feel like they belong. And so I, I always, I, I just, I don't know, I think it's unavoidable. I don't know that you can sit there and talk to them about this. I don't. Like, hey, man, your sports observations are really annoying. And nobody wants to hear them anymore. So please tone them down and be somebody different when you're at these events. I don't know. I would just invite him to a few less of them because you clearly care about his feelings enough. It seems like, you know, that's important. The friendship part of it's important. But it's a weird thing to tell somebody like, hey, shut up. When we're at games, shut up. Stop talking about stuff. <laughs> but I've I've heard this so many different times. And it definitely happens to me a little bit more too because – you know, as I've shared stories in the past, there'll just be a guy and it's like, he doesn't really care about what my answer is. He just wants to tell me what his answer is. So I'll ask a question and it's like, you can see in his mind, he's not even listening to your answer. He's just waiting for you to finish so that he can give you the answer to his own question. And then he's expecting you to agree. And then when you disagree, you're like, yeah, it's not really what I think happened. It's like, yeah, well, you're wrong. I'm like, okay, cool. It's great. Great meeting you, man. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Kyle. Um, it seems like it, the one thing from the email, it seemed like Steve's the guy with the nice TV and a little extra seating because he was like, I don't want to say something and risk not getting invited to events. I think that's what it said. Um, I don't know. Maybe I wouldn't watch MMA with the guy. Cause that seems. Super oh annoying. yeah. Great call. Kyle Kyle's automatically thinking like, how would this impact my enjoyment? Yeah. Should I confront him about these tendencies he has and ask him to tone it down, stop and risk not being invited to live events in the future. I think don't confront him. I think like if it's like a game and it's snowing, just be like, all right, we got it, Steve. Like that's like that's okay. You know to what you could moment. do? You know what you could do? Kyle, you inspire me. You could do just an absolute mad dog blitz on him with the rest of the guys. <laughs> Where you go, the first time he says this is what he would have done, <laughs> the next time we're watching UFC, we're just making a dude pact here. Where we just let into him God damn it, verbally. Steve. Like just <laughs> unleash where five or six of us you can't stop be like will you shut up about what you would do in all these fights and whether it's play calling or the refs or whatever we get it we get it and it's just 
But the thing is, it might ding him up a little bit emotionally. Like, he might not ever be the same because none of us, <laughs> very few of us, I should say, uh, you know, want to be told straight up what they're doing that everybody hates. Like, hey, man, this is the thing we all think that sucks about you. So please enjoy for the next 10 minutes as we tell you. That's a tough thing to do. It's a really tough thing to do. And usually guys don't come out of it stronger. Uh, people are like, oh, this is going to make me stronger. Be, no, no. You're mentally going to be like, God. Because that's, that's something else that's always good to kind of keep yourself in check. You're like, what do people say behind my back? What do people say about me behind my back? And I'd be like, oh, they could probably say this. Oh, they definitely say this. Oh, they say that? Um, I don't know. It's a horrifying exercise, but sometimes it's worth doing to yourself. And then sometimes guys are incapable of doing it because be like, what are you talking about? What would you say about it? I'm awesome. Like, are you kidding me? Arm bars, dude. <laughs> Saruti, anything to add? Well, I was going to say, that's, that's like a firing squad situation where if you all attack this one guy, it's no one guy's fault. So he can just be mad at, the, at all of you, but he's not going to be mad at one of you. So he kind of gets the hint and then everyone gets to kind of move on. But I'll also say... I do feel like MMA guy, the guy that's aggressively talking about how he would do arm bars and why this guy isn't tough enough. That guy, I feel like is insecure about his own toughness. Is he not? Because those guys, I just feel like the MMA guy, I got, it doesn't bother me when there's a guy being like, oh, this coach sucks at timeouts. This guy gets fired. But it does feel like the guy who's like, oh, this dude is not tough or like he should keep your hands up. The MMA fighting guy, <laughs> I just feel like he's masking something. There's something there that he's like insecure about his own toughness. He wants to prove to everybody else that he's really tough. Yeah, that's that's definitely part of it. And they, I mean, the great thing with MMA, you could be like, hey, start fighting guys. Exactly. Well, yeah, well, that doesn't happen. No, I'm saying like, hey, show up to a gym, you know, start rolling around on a mat. Do it. I mean, no one can sit here and, and say, you know, one of my things with my dad, he used to, he was convinced he could get like eight points in an NBA game. <laughs> and I was <laughs> like that. You're big and you're a great shooter, but you're like 50. Give me a break. He'd be like, you really don't think with enough shots you couldn't get eight points? I'd go, if they decide you're not getting your shot off, it's not going to happen. And he, we would laugh about it because he was kind of kidding, but he was kind of serious a little bit. But here's the thing is that that's not an option. The fighting part of MMA expert of what I would have done, and be like, great, go ahead. You can get into an amateur fight in a year. Go ahead and do it. And then nobody does it. Okay, uh, real estate drama. Uh, speaking of, we had a, a handful of people chime in uh, about our man in Arizona on his um, his real estate. It wasn't a dilemma. He's going to make a profit. I brought up, make sure you check in the capital gains tax. We had many people uh, reach out, almost all of you helpful. One guy was a complete dick about it um, because I didn't know all the capital gains tax rules on investments, depending on if you qualified for the two and five or two out of five or whatever. Um and I guess we could do that where if I'm not 100% on every single subject here, we could not do some of those things. But um, I appreciate guys checking in. And I even emailed the guy follow up. I said, hey, it looks like if you're under 250, you're going to be in the clear here. If you've lived there for the two years, like you said, um, and then we'll leave it at that. So um, I appreciate so many people reaching out and being cool about it and uh, making sure a listener had all the information. Because, yes, believe it or not, I don't know. Um, everything about all of this stuff and that's why i'm hesitant at times to do it because i don't want you being like well not sure if i should buy or sell but i'm going to tell the wife the guy on the podcast said now that is the time to move because i don't know all of these markets other than the markets that i'm in so here's a market that's been on fire that probably scares me a little bit so let's talk about it all right family real estate drama for you Bay Area, I became one-sixth owner of an investment property near downtown San Jose. Uh, my grandparents put this property in a grandchildren's trust for us to inherit when they passed. They were the sweetest people you'd ever meet, and I'm grateful to have such a generous inheritance. The house is old, two-bed, one-bath, built in 1930 with serious foundation issues. The real value is in the location close to downtown. It sits on a 6,000-square-foot lot. We, the grandkids, now have to decide what to do with the property. There are six of us total, myself, my three sisters, and two cousins. All right, so it's you, the four siblings, and then the two cousins. Four of us want to sell now. Two of us want to buy the others out and keep the house as a rental property. One of my sisters, both my cousins, and I see this as a bad investment when you consider the foundation repairs and other maintenance the house will need. Plus, I would rather get the money out now, put it towards property of my own, and start building equity towards something that is 100% mine. My other two sisters... Um, view this as an opportunity to buy an investment property below market value. And ideally, the rent money would cover the cost of repairs and maintenance. I can't blame them for wanting to go that route, but 
They are five years older than me, so they have a little bit more capital than your boy right now in case these things go south. The problem now is that we disagree on the buyout price. Everybody in the history of time, whenever these things happen, God, all I hear are horror stories about this stuff. Like, it's great, the inheritance thing. It's better than zero, but whenever people try to keep these houses in the family and then split them up, and then next thing you know, you're next to the third generation here. I don't know. I don't, I don't hear a, a, like, yeah, there was 12 of us and we all agreed on the same price and sold it. And it was great. And not one person was pissed off. I just don't hear that very often. So the problem is that disagree in the buyout price. Um, certainly there'd be a big difference in the appraisal price and the true market value of the home. If we were to sell in the open market, the four sellers wants what, what, uh, want what's fair and are willing to meet somewhere in the middle based on the appraisal and true market value. But the two sisters have stated they will only be able to pay us out at the appraisal number and nothing beyond that. All right. Well, that's bullshit. Um, so you're saying two of the sisters want the appraisal number now as most or some, and again, I, I don't want to go too into the deep end because I understand that I'm also not a real estate expert, but for any transaction I've ever had, like the appraisal price versus the real market price, appraisal price is always lower. It just, Different places will be different, but for the most part, especially when you're looking at the property taxes, you look at the appraisal number and you're like, oh, okay. So it's the appraisals just, it generally comes in lower. Um, some places don't, I would say more places that I've been, the appraisal was lower. I don't know if that's going to happen here. All right. But if they're trying to sell you with the appraisal and it's a big, big gap between that and the market price, that's bullshit. And so I'm actually on your side on that one. Um, Cause you know, it's, it's found money, basically. It's incredible the grandparents left this here for you. But now, because at first when I thought you were complaining about the price, I'm like, well, okay, so now you want to discount or you want to bump on the, the found money. But what they want is they want to make money in the inheritance. And now they're going to make money on you by buying you out um, because of whatever an appraisal number is right now. But again, I don't know what the gap would be between market and appraisal number. You're telling me it would be less. I don't know. I don't know the market. After that, uh, things in the group chat got a little heated between the cousin and the sisters, which led to one of the sisters saying that our number one priority should be keeping it in the family. And that's what grandma would have wanted if she were alive. Well, apparently grandma wanted you guys to have one sixth ownership. So you weren't going to keep the house forever, but whatever. Um, which our emailer says, which I thought was totally uncalled for. Again, I agree with the emailer here. Despite my frustration, I played peacekeeper in the group chat and suggest that we all wait and see what the appraisal comes back at first. But let's be real. This is just as much about money to them as it is to us, right? <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. It's like, no, no one's innocent here in hoping it works out in their favor. Why should I be sacrificing part of my inheritance for their benefit? I hope I don't sound like an ungrateful prick, but I have plans in the next uh, five-ish years to start a family of my own. And this money is going to help me do that. I love my sisters, I've always gotten along with them. I'm afraid, though, if we can't get on the same page, this is going to cause a rift in the family. Not only would that affect my relationship with my sisters, it also affect my relationship with my dad. This is the house his father grew up in. I know he's very sentimentally attached. He's already told me that he supports Brittany and Sarah's decision to buy us out, even to the point where he would be willing to co-sign on a loan to make it happen. My hope is that they ultimately understand our side of it, that with homes selling like crazy right now, we could be leaving hundreds of thousands of dollars on the table, especially considering it's Silicon Valley real estate. All right. So um, that's another part of it is that that market's just absurd. Um, so I, I think I'd be scared of holding long, long term there. But again, I don't know. I don't know. All right. So you, may, you brought up a great point because on all of this, like if you're going to play the family card and this is what grandma would want, but you're also getting my share for below market value, like don't fucking bring that up. That, that's bullshit. That's total bullshit. So I... I'd agree with you. I don't know if you can do anything other than, you know, if you said, hey, let's wait it out and I'll do it in five years, you're never going to get on the same page here. It's been a bad start. It probably doesn't mean it's going to be a good ending. I think the only thing you could really do is come up with some kind of an agreement where you go, can we do, I mean, the appraisal number, like I said, they usually come in lower. So that's not fair to you. And that's, if that's what you're telling us, is there any way that you could get, you know, three realtors to tell you what it would get on the market? And then everybody decide ahead of time, although it would suck if like one of the sisters said, oh, I have a real estate agent friend and she's going to give us a lower number. You go, can we do this? Can we talk to three different agents about listing it? We're not going to list it. Ask them for a price. 
Although they'll probably tell you a higher price that you'll want to list it and then be like, hey, so somebody came in a couple hundred grand under, but we think this is the right time to sell it. Um, is there any way you guys can come to some sort of communal agreement about a price beyond just whatever the tax assessment is? Now, and then go, hey, you know, we'll, we'll take the one in the middle and that'll be the buyout price because I don't, you know, I, but this is good luck with this one. Um, I wasn't going to solve your problem here in the email, but I would, I would tell you that this is a pretty bad start. So I don't know why everybody's going to get along here because every time somebody, one of the sisters says it's about family or something like that, it's like, no, it isn't. It's about you getting me out at a lower one six share based on a number that isn't a real reflection of the value. So good luck. Don't like that. It's like teetering on the edge yeah. of being ugly. It's like it's like a couple more weird conversations from like being in Judge Judy. Yeah, I gotta I gotta tell you, I I didn't think you were gonna offer a ton on that one, but I like that you brought in little Judge Judy. What would be your number one go to daytime show, Kyle, when you have nothing to do? It's always a court show. No, doesn't matter. Uh, I used to be a Judge Joe Brown guy. I thought he was just super charming. I like Judge Mathis. He's leaning more towards like paternity tests and stuff now, and it's Zoom and it's. So I'm just Judge Judy's my number one. Hot Bench is interesting. Three judges. Hot Bench is good, but Judge Judy, no doubt. She's not really daytime anymore. She's like four o'clock, I think. Three, four o'clock. So she's still like flirting with uh, prime time. There you have it. So wait a minute. Mathis has just gone to paternity for you? Yeah. I mean, and it's Zoom too. Like Judge Judy, they're like, all right, let's get him tested. We'll get him in the courtroom. Mathis is like every other one is, you know. I don't know. Yeah, it just she doesn't was, feel she the was same. dating around, but you know, it's 20 years in and we just wanted, I just want to know if my daughter is, so it's like you, you guys have petitioned the court to find out. So I was like, this isn't, it's not for me, but I like Judge Mathis. So, you know, I'll give him a go every once in a while. There's no greater tease in television history than we'll find out if you're the father next. I mean, whenever I'm in a hotel, you know, showering in the room, getting ready to run out. And then I'm like, I can't go anywhere until I find out. <laughs> I can't do, you know, and then they just time it out perfectly. It's a big deal. There's going to be, what what could be the podcast equivalent of that? There isn't, there really isn't anything. There's just, because again, you're on the podcast, so you're not going to like change, you could turn it off, but I don't know. Well, if you put like an ad break in between your 2002 year, maybe that would do it. We just throw like three DAI ads in there before like the next thing. It'd stick around. (laughs) I know. I, um. I don't even know if I would have emailed the show back in 02. Be like, hey, man, so this is the deal. Like, it's a one bedroom, but it isn't really. But you know what? There's a lot of storage under that law. <laughs> All right. Thursday, we have, I think we're going to get dough for this week. I'm not 100% sure. There's a couple other to do things that I need to do the follow up on. Um, I also did the top five draft picks from different front offices. I have to apologize to the entire audience for this one, but. I thought I was going to be able to get those done when we did the Simmons and Jalen Brown thing more often, but between me not wanting to bug guys and then guys kind of helping and then being like, yeah, no problem, or I'll do it tomorrow, whatever. I just realized this was stupid for me to promise this to the audience. So I, I apologize for that, but I do have a couple that are almost done, but now I don't want to say anything about it because I've not done a good job delivering on that after that was really cool to get those scouts perspectives on different players. So we'll do some more of it, but I'm certainly not going to promise anything because I did not. Uh, follow through so thanks as always checking out the podcast spread the word subscribe rate review thank you to steve cerruti and kyle Crichton.